Gary Lineker is the former British football player and current sports broadcaster known for his nice guy persona, having never received a yellow or red card in his entire professional career. In 1995, he entered into an advertisement deal with Walkers, a British snack manufacturer primarily known for producing crisps, or as Americans call them, chips. In the adverts, Lineker would be seen going to extreme lengths in order to procure a packet of said crisps, often stealing from children in a juxtaposition of his nice guy image. Now that that's out of the way, today on Diminishing Returns, we're looking at shark slasher movie Deep Blue Sea. Hello, yes, today we're talking about Deep Blue Sea. I'm Calvin, my hat is like a shark's fin, and with me are Alan. Hello. And Sol. You're right. Okay, right. Um, did you, sorry, did you just say my hat is like a shark's fin? Yes, and I thought you two were also going to do quotes from LL Cool J's theme song. <laughs> was that what it was? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't no. get it. I wasn't sure what you were doing there. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no laughter or anything. I just thought, okay. Well, <laughs> well I didn't. I didn't. Unfortunately, I haven't doing. studied the uh, rap song over the credits in as much detail as maybe I should have. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not? That lyric, just like my hat is like a shark's fin. <laughs> I had no idea he'd even done a song over the end. Credits oh, didn't you? Oh, I made a note of that to bring up to you specifically because I know how much you love a rap song by one of the stars. I love a Will Smith mm. rap song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, saying, this is very much wannabe Will Smith. Uh, are you saying LL Cool J doesn't measure up to Will Smith? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think I've ever really listened to his music. So we're looking at Deep Blue Sea. Uh, it's become it's come about because of uh, a direct to home media sequel, Deep Blue Sea Two, which is coming out shortly after this release. But I've been wanting to cover this film for a while now, as I think we talked about in our previous Shallows episode, I have a bit of a thing for shark films, these kinds of uh, people trapped and they have to fend off sharks, like, you know, Jaws is the obvious example, and uh, (laughs) normally I I like to choose a shark film for the summer, but it just seemed to fit quite nicely with the release of the sequel. I mean, Um, you you, you say that, this is our third shark film, this show has been going for like a year and a half, has it? Two years? Two years. For two two years, years? So how how has yeah. that happened? <laughs> what? Well, how's the show been going that long? I mean, <laughs> no, I, I asked myself that very same question. But... <laughs> if you pick one every summer, how have we done three? Well, Alan picked Jaws. Um... Oh. Wait a minute, yeah. How... <laughs> <laughs> but we have done three, haven't we? Anyway. Um... Yeah, this is... This is the third one, but we're a little bit early. If this was in, like, August, oh, yes, yes. that would be sort yes, of the yes. third year of doing one. Yeah, yeah. The way yeah. things are going, I, mean, I, I think that... I think sharks might become a biannual tradition, to be honest. It, you're, you're mad on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, I'm obsessed, and Sol is really against this, so I actually <laughs> want to start this by giving a shout-out to... Well, not a shout-out, to uh, implore the listeners to take to our Facebook page and Twitter pages and all those things and... <laughs> If if you really want to hear reviews of more shark films, then let us know, because Sol has this bizarre, like, quota in his mind, which means that we can only cover one shark movie a year, which what, I... What's the hashtag? Say, <laughs> hashtag Calvin's Sharks. <laughs> that's, uh, Calvin, that's you don't know awful. anything about hashtags. The important thing about a hashtag is to make it very clear uh, what it's about. Calvin's so, Sharks is very what about clear. Hashtag Calvin wants to do more shark movies... But Sol doesn't because he has a quota <laughs> thing in his head. Is that a good one? <laughs> You've got to be very concise. Calvin's sharks. Hashtag more jaws. <laughs> That's what you Moors. want. Moors. Moors. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, um, there is a, a major release shark film coming out this summer is called it? Meg, starring <laughs> Jason Statham. No, there isn't. So- what? Cold what? Yeah, I know. So I think that there is um, opportunity there. Hang on, what, what, is it, what is it called? Meg? As in like a Megalodon. Oh, I thought it was oh. like a shark called Old Meg who got loose or something. <laughs> I'm Old Meg! <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm quite excited for that film. They're uh, seriously because... abbreviating Megalodon to Meg 
and expecting people yeah. to go with it. Apparently. <laughs> wow. Jason Statham um, is Meg. <laughs> <laughs> or it's the Meg, I, I, I believe. Oh, that makes oh, sense. Still. still pretty bad. The, the Meg. I'm, I'm, quite ex- I'm quite excited for that, as I was excited for The Shallows a few years ago, <laughs> because these kind of shark movies don't come about all that much and they the ones that do come about go straight to DVD or straight to the sci-fi network or whatever. Um, and Deep Blue Sea is the first one that I can think of which came about after CGI became more affordable to use in uh, in these kinds of movies. Um, yeah. I mean, I uh, this film I would put in this co- sort of category as... Um, Anaconda, mm. uh, yes. Lake Placid, is that the one with yeah. the big creature in it? Yeah. Like you got you, all sort of similar you put a uh, rapper yeah. in it, you kind of put an older, quite good actor in it, and then fill the rest up with just nobodies. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's that, there seemed to be a bit of a rash of them, wasn't there? And was that because of CGI? They, were, they could kind of do it? Get Jurassic Park, it? I believe, was what I mean. Um, obviously, one of the biggest films of all time made good use of CGI and uh, you know people running away from yeah. animals trying to eat them. Obviously, Jurassic Park was aimed at more of a family audience than I think Anaconda, Lake Placid, Deep Blue Sea. But also in the late nineties, there were a lot of disaster movies out. Yeah. Dante's yeah. Peak, Deep Impact, Volcano. Armageddon, all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think there was just a big resurgence in people running away from elements of nature. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's how we got Deep Blue Sea. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I've, I'd seen this film before, but it was a very long time ago. So I did watch it again, um, and I, I can't say I really remembered much about it. So this was fairly fresh mm. for me. How, how were you mm. coming into it? Well, I'd um, seen it many of many a time, uh, which probably. Uh, shows my hand of how I feel about the film. It, it was notable for being the first ever DVD we as a family owned. It was, uh, I think, when they were when we when we got a DVD player, it was with one of those deals where you had to pick a film out of you know a selection of three. And for some reason, my stepdad decided to get this. Because you're and, what, were, what were the other options? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I really don't know. But it must have been other like Warner Brothers late nineties fair. Uh, Anyway, I remember watching it then, and it's, it had a quite a lasting impact on me for the ending. Uh, uh, it, I, I knew you were going to laugh at that, but being like 12 years old and seeing what happens at the end, it, it was surprising, I thought, and quite shocking, but we'll, we'll get there, I'm sure. I'm trying to think of what happens at the end that was particularly shocking. I know, I can't, I Saffron, can't think of anything. Standard action. Saffron Burrows gets eaten. Yeah. Yeah. That's shocking. Really? Was it? Okay. Yeah, because her and Thomas Jane, the, the two leads, no, male no. and female, they're always getting together. No, because she'd done... She'd done she had to pay the price for what she'd done. She had to sacrifice... Mm. And it was always going to be a sacrifice to save others kind of death. A, a, it wasn't in the shooting script. A redemptive uh, death. Not in the shooting script, but we'll, Ooh, we'll get there, I we'll suppose. To that. Oh, look who's got the background information. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sol, what about you? You hate sharks of... You know, I, films shark is, about sharks. I so. first came to this film when you forced me to watch it at university <laughs> one night. Um, Did I actually? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't remember. You, you that. made a big night of it, like, oh, we're gonna watch the best. Oh, you'll love this film. This film's so great. Deep Blue Sea. Oh, you like a good zombie movie? You will love a good shark movie. <laughs> and you put. On- I don't think I'll have ever said that. <laughs> You put it on. Uh, our other housemates might have been involved. I can't really remember. Uh, yeah, that, that was the first and only time I watched it until what about it um, for this. What about zombie sharks, guys? Let's bring you two together. Pirates of the Caribbean? Mm. Pirates of the Caribbean, the last one, was it? Yeah. They had oh, zombie yeah. sharks in that. Oh, there is a film called go. Ghost Shark. I don't Urban know much about it. Ghost Shark, mm. Urban Jaws. It's got the guy out of Troll 2 in it, I believe. The dentist. Ah. So, just to uh, give people an indication of the plot, it, it's um, Saffron Burrows is the, our lead actress, and she's running a facility which is out in the middle of the ocean, which is experimenting on sharks to try and find a cure for Alzheimer's, because there's something to do with sharks' oh, it's brains. It's always so Alzheimer's. They're always fucking around <laughs> with animals' brains. 
And it always goes wrong. And, and in the process of these experiments, um, Saffron Burroughs has made the sharks super smart. So when a storm hits the facility, they uh, start running riot and smash their way in. Um, front of, you know, picking off the humans one by one. It's very much a slasher film mentality. Until the last few remaining people um, are on the surface, and of course they win uh, and blow up the sharks. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's it. pretty, pretty standard in terms of that of the structure, in terms of the characters. Uh, you know, there's a couple of people who manage to survive, but they're being picked off one by one, and uh, you've got these sort of set character archetypes. Um, it's not particularly groundbreaking um and what it does it does fairly poorly <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's not good is it let's let's, let's face it oh, I'm, I'm glad i'm not gonna be the only uh <laughs> negative nelly <laughs> oh. well, look, positive I mean, poly when, over it <laughs> when i when i defend the film and say that i like it it's of course you know, in context, obviously this isn't a Citizen Kane or a <laughs> Clockwork Orange, anything like that. But in terms of, and I think probably if I did indeed try showing it, you saw at university and with our other housemates, it was probably because I think this is actually quite a good film to watch with some booze and some friends and some snacks and just sort of ignore the talking bits and just <laughs> tune in for yeah. the hilarious shark deaths. I guess, yeah, it, I is, think that was it is one you'd... Idea, yeah. Yeah, if you don't pay too much attention to it, it may not seem as bad, yeah. Mm-hmm. Are they well, are they hilarious shark deaths, though? Because I... <laughs> oh, yes. Are they? <laughs> Still in Skarsgård gets his arm ripped yeah, off. Yeah, he's one of the only ones like, I remember, and I wouldn't call it funny. His, his, he just... <laughs> his like, arm is quite clearly, like... You know, inside tucked in his, you know, his, his pullover. In his oh, so, pants. so yeah, you mean he's like flailing around on the? So you don't mean funny in any sort of intended way? Just funny because the film. Oh shit. no. <laughs> um, in in ways, yeah. And there's that there's that blonde woman who um is in the uh the water and the shark comes up below her and she like jumps up and like high fives Thomas Jane on the way up. Uh, it's funny. The only one I can think uh, of that legitimately comes across as a joke is Samuel L. Jackson. Oh, yes, mm. of course, because he's the big name mm. in the film <laughs> who has these... He's just sort of dropping in these lines. He's, like, one of the f- founders or something, and he's touring the facility, and he's dropping in these lines all throughout the early scenes of some avalanche that he was in or something, yeah. and people are like, oh, you're, you're the one from that from the avalanche. Like, yeah, yeah. And then eventually he has to give this big rallying speech and I think it's probably probably the most famous bit of the yeah, film. Yeah, I, I was well aware um, of this one scene somehow well yeah. before I came to see the film. Um, yeah. He's giving this rousing speech about what he did in the avalanche uh, which basically amounts to he, him and his mates like killed some of the people? Uh, anyway... And they did. They didn't have the strength to overcome the situation together or whatever. And he's telling them not to be like them. But then, whilst he's in the middle of this speech, the shark grabs him from behind and drags him into the water. Uh, yeah, that was the only bit where it seemed deliberately kind of uh, subversive. Yeah, uh, humorous. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like oh, what? They deliber- no, hang on a minute. Deliberately, kind of. Uh, setting it up as this kind of very overblown cinematic speech and then undercutting it by killing him. Whereas everything else they did completely like straight and po-faced. As Apart from LL Cool J, who's a very different I was about kind to say. of comedy. That's more of a Michael Yeah, that's Bay different. Style. That's just a... Yeah, that's just yeah. a... He's just a character. That's that's different. But... Um... You know, he <clears> does... He does the exact same thing in one of the Halloween films where he's just like a supporting part and for the most part he isn't really that involved in the main action and he's not got many scenes with the other characters but he's sort of off doing his own thing and then comes in at the end. Yeah. Well, can we hear he's we... a chef on the facility. Yeah, can we talk about the cast before we because we sort yes. of jumping around all over the place. Let's talk about the cast. Well, my my note was my note was this is such a shitty 90s cast. <laughs> Um, is it? I mean, obviously you got you got Samuel L. Jackson. There, I think it's quite who... a good cast. You got mm-hmm. Samuel L. Jackson. You got yeah, you got Having Samuel L. Jackson. He's obviously the big sharks. your big money get that yeah. you, he's <laughs> the, he's the name that you're going to use. 
You've got Thomas Jane, who is like a prototype Paul Walker. Well, I don't know what Thomas and that, Jane is. And that's not a compliment, so... <laughs> and I don't know him from anything else. He just seems to be like a... Like, a, just a blank cipher of a yeah, exactly, leading man. Yeah, that's exactly what he is. The same then, is true of Saffron Burroughs. Saffron Burroughs. No, I mean, at least yeah. Thomas Jane seems like he can act at a basic <laughs> level. To- Saffron Burroughs <laughs> is sub-Bond girl level of acting. It's uh, it's just... She's appalling. Well, I've not seen her in, I don't think, anything else. No, but from what go. I understand, a lot of her filmography is, like, arty, pretentious films so i wondered if this was just like a paycheck thing for her and she just wasn't you know bothering to act uh or maybe she's just like this all the time i don't know yeah maybe uh what else has she done just all sorts of just british films yeah i have no idea really mm. oh. and then you got michael rapaport is, is that why of... you think it's a comedy calvin because it's got michael rapaport in it no, I I only know him from Friends. That's the only other thing I've seen he's like him. A, he's one of Phoebe's. He's like a sitcom actor, couple of episodes isn't he, primarily. Oh, okay. I don't know. Is he? I, 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 can, I mean, I, I mean. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know for years. He's in a sitcom where he plays the dad. Yeah, it, but that was, yeah. That's sort of in the later of his career. Well, I know him for that this. and Friends, and I think he might. Have yeah, he's just one of those show here. jobbing actors. But this is that the Michael Rappaport part is he's like the kind of slightly zany one who's supposed to be like, it's the Bill Pex, Bill Paxton role, isn't it? Um, but yeah, they obviously yeah. couldn't get Bill Paxton. <laughs> so uh, the and they they all these characters they fit into very basic archetypes. It's not nothing. Yeah. And and LL Cool J plays the uh, like you say the chef who they kind of <clears throat> set him up earlier on. And then forget about him for ages. Yeah. <laughs> and and when they're trying to escape, no one goes, should we try and get uh, the chef? <laughs> they just go, oh my God, we've got to escape. Is there anyone else on board? Uh, uh, there may be the help. And, <laughs> and Stellan Skarsgård. Yeah. Yes. Now, Stellan Skarsgård is a good actor. Yeah. Um, he, he's not afraid to do shit films, though. Um <laughs> Well, I was going to ask, what was his career like around this time? Because this is probably the first film that I am aware of him being in, in ter- you know, in terms of uh, chronology. Uh, uh, 1999. Well, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen him look younger than thing. this film, so... <laughs> he still looks exactly the same, <laughs> yeah. I thought, as he does now. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Swedish stuff. Oh, he's in The Hunt for Red October. Oh. But yeah. I don't know if he's a big role in that. Uh, Breaking mm. the Waves was very much a kind of big breakthrough for... Him and uh, Emily Watson, is that her name? Um, oh, right, yeah, yeah. Goodwill Hunting, 97. He's in that. Ah, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so but so this was kind of, yeah, he, a couple of years in to starting to break Hollywood. And so, mm. but yeah, I mean, he's not, he's not an actor who's sort of playing big, he, he plays these supporting roles, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, he, he is one yeah. of the first, well, if not the first to, die as well, which I think is a shame. Mm. I would have much preferred the film if he'd been yeah. one of the people mm. to make it to the end. Swap him and Thomas Jane mm. round and this film would be so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But does Stellan Skarsgård look uh, good with his shirt off? I bet you he does. <laughs> <laughs> he was running around naked in that Thor movie, wasn't he? How did he look then? <laughs> like a 55-year-old man with no clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> Bail to that. Mm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so that's most of the cast, isn't it? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. There's another uh, woman yeah, there's... in it who I've never seen in anything or even heard of, of her. Jacqueline McKenzie, yeah. who yeah, I've never seen in anything else. Um, uh, which they're, they're all the ones that are sort of... Oh, and Ada Turturro is yeah, she's... one of the people there as well. She's the, the one in the, she's the one in the tower who kind of gets killed yeah. quite quickly. And... Yeah, I know her from The Sopranos and stuff like that, but she's... Uh, but yeah, it is a small cast, and it's very much set up to be. Hey, look, it's a handful of people in this enclosed area. Like that's the whole mm. point. Like alien, like mm. whatever. It's it's mm. it's a nice setup. It's it works. Let, let, let's not. Um, I was having some flashback. Oh, sorry. Go let's on. not omit as well Frank Welker as oh, is he, as is the, is he the shark. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh well, the parrot Fantastic. talks quite distinctly. Well, this uh, this says Mary well Kate spoken. Bergman is the parrot uncredited. Oh really? <laughs> so I think she must have been the parrot when it had like dialogue, and Frank Welker, who was credited, must have <laughs> just been <laughs> a squawking. 
Ah, interesting. Do you think he might have done some of the shark noises I as bet well? He did. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You wouldn't get Frank Welker mm. on on you know on your payroll and not have him do a few shark noises. <laughs> <laughs> I tell I tell you what this film did. Um, following on from your point, then Alan, it, it did kind of remind me a lot of um, Alien Resurrection in a lot of places in terms of like late nineties mm, yeah. uh, action, lazy fare. direction. Especially that there's a scene where they're in like a, a tunnel and they're go, you know climbing a ladder. Oh, I made like... that exact same note. Yeah. Um, oh, but oh, that no way. reminded me of every shit nineties film ever. Like Hollow Man has that scene. Um, that's the one uh-huh. that comes to mind for some reason. But but yeah, I put it's like the bit in Alien Resurrection where they're having to climb up a ladder to get away, and I've never seen anyone climb a ladder so fucking slowly in my life. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I, I I tell you, I really like that scene. I like that there's water underneath them and fire above them, and they're trying to get to a certain point. Uh, the yeah, duality but just of man, isn't climb it? the ladder quickly, people. What's wrong <laughs> with you? What is Rennie Harlan saying about? Uh... Shall we speak about Rennie Harlan? Well, yeah, he's the director, uh, one of uh, Soul's favorite directors, I believe, what? from uh, Die Hard Three. <laughs> oh, that was... No, no, he did. No, he didn't do Die Hard he's Three. Done he did Die, Die Hard, Hard 2. Two. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh, right. Mm, okay, then yeah, I take that back. Didn't John McTiernan uh, come back to do Die Hard? Yeah, he 3? did. The yeah, he did. That's yeah. No, this, this guy mm-hmm. did. Uh, what did he do? Longlist Good Night. <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street 4, I think, 4 or 5. Well, that's your breakthrough role, isn't it? Exorcist then he did Die Hard 2 off the back of that. Yeah. Wasn't he married to Gina Davies for a while? He Didn't certainly he was, that? yeah. And they made Cutthroat uh, Island, which was a massive flop. Yes, because um, this mustn't have been too much long <clears throat> later after Well, that, that was 95. They did Long Kiss Goodnight in 96, which was with Samuel L. Jackson. That was well received. And then, ah. <clears throat> yeah, they did all right. And then Deep Blue Sea was his next film. Um, Interesting. And he's definitely not... Had a strong career. Mm. He, he seems um, like but a, he seems to keep working. He seems like a special effects guy who became a director. Just his like choice of mm. Mm, but he maybe. doesn't seem to be <laughs> that. Um. No, I mean, like, I, I watched some of the behind-the-scenes stuff and listened to parts of the commentary on the Blu-ray. He's a camera guy. He was mainly talking about technical... Yeah, no, he was mainly talking about the technical aspects of the sharks mm-hmm. and the CGI and the... He didn't really... T- you know, there was no talk of the process of getting a good performance out of the actors or anything like that. It was all very technical. Yeah, he's done a couple um, of short films in, like, the camera department, so I think that's how he started out, and he just went on to direct pretty swiftly from the look of it. Hmm, well, interesting. <clears throat> what about the sharks themselves? Um, mm, I, I have to say that the... I think they're pretty good. Mm, when yeah, they're when I they're agree. when they're actual physical sharks, you can tell they look they look nice, they look pretty cool. Um and they do they're not afraid to show them, which shows mm. their confidence in in the things. And then when it be- mm. when they become computer generated, I think that holds up, especially to say this is 1999 technology, I think it holds up very well. The The, the worst bits are when people get killed. <clears throat> the worst bits are when people get killed because they can't seem to do humans very well. But mm. the sharks mm. are pretty good. And I guess the shark is just a big sort of blob, isn't it? With a, You just need a bit of jaw movement. It's not a particularly complicated <laughs> thing to create. So mm. it suits this sort of thing. I completely agree. I think, especially when you compare this to, let's say, Jaws of the Revenge, which was just ten years prior to it, the models of the sharks have advanced so much and look so much better. There's just something about the texture mm. and when the water's dripping off them, because <clears> there were quite a few animatronic sharks and they pick them up out of the water and yeah. move them around. I think they look fantastic. I think when you're comparing the 80s to the 90s, you you can't really say just ten years with regards to like, <laughs> computer technology. Well... It's... <laughs> Well, to say that the shark in Jaws the Revenge didn't improve from the shark from Jaws, which was like 15 years prior or whatever, <laughs> and I still think it's quite a achievement. Hmm. So, we we start the film with um, a lot of exposition, and uh, mm. that pretty much just carries on throughout the entire film. <laughs> it's just very, <laughs> very clunky dialogue, very exposition-heavy stuff. Um, mm, mm. Uh, uh, very crude writing. I mean, who wrote this? It was. It's not good. It's... Duncan Kennedy, Donna Powers, and Wayne Powers. Yeah, so. I mean, have they done anything else? It's not. None of them have Wikipedia pages, so mm, I don't know if they you know. 
Uh, yeah, not <clears throat> and like I said, it's very much a, it's a very straightforward structure and characters, and so you need good writing to bring that alive, and it's not there. Mm. So there's really never any doubt about what's happening. Sometimes people get killed a bit sooner than you expect or whatever, but um, yeah, it's all very by the numbers, isn't it? Duncan Kennedy has four writing credits to their name. Um, okay. No. Deep Blue Sea was their first. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's an episode of The Outer Limits, a TV movie called Curse of the Talisman, and a 2012 mm. film which appears to be a shark film called Bait. Oh. Oh, is that the one where it's in the supermarket? Freak Tsunami. Yeah, it is. I, I remember the trailer for that. Yeah. I've seen that film. <laughs> okay. It's hilarious. It's like, yeah, a tsunami hits this beach town and a load of people are trapped in a supermarket with, like, sharks. I must admit, around. I quite like to see that one. I remember the trailer. It sounded really stupid. <laughs> oh, well, maybe, maybe this summer. And uh, the, the powers... Hashtag Calvin's <laughs> sharks. The powers um, couple, siblings, whatever they are, uh, <laughs> they've written the Italian Job remake. Oh, okay. And a lot of TV. This kind of production does sort of smack of like, and it came down as an executive order. Probably, I can't imagine this was anyone's passion project. Yeah. It was sort of like, right, right, we need a shark film. Um, what can we do? What can we get? Uh, yeah. Um, the- I, I would, I would um, just like to comment on your uh, by the numbers. Uh, statement there, Alan. Like, you know. did either of you think that? Because like, Saffron Burrow's character getting killed at the end. I still think is quite surprising because I'm conditioned to think that the attractive 30-something leads in films like this are just going to get it together at some point. So I always just assumed that her and Thomas Jane were going to get together. Yeah, Um, I mean... And the fact that she does sacrifice herself at the end uh, and, and succeeds in it. The character that she portrays is very much the character who does something wrong, perhaps not intentionally, that leads to great disaster, and therefore has to sacrifice herself to save everyone else in a redemptive death, right? So mm. that is very much her character. So in that sense, it wasn't surprising. The fact that that character mm. is played by the attractive female lead is more unusual, I'll give you that. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. usually... Yeah, that would be the Stellan Skarsgård role, I guess. <laughs> um, mm. uh, so yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Uh, but the character she was playing was very much that type mm. and they just left it really late and and her her sacrificial death was it, it was a bit pointless really it didn't really need to happen yeah <laughs> like yeah. that was the problem with it they'd already escaped by that point just stay out of the water and you're all mm. right well I, I guess this is a good point to talk about the original ending where she did in fact survive okay. uh, but when they were testing the film audiences hated that character so much that, that there's an interview with Rennie Harlan where he talks about like the response and people were actually writing Oh, what was it they wrote? Uh, Kill the bitch on their <laughs> test cards. Uh, and people were very angry about it. So they actually like did an extra day of reshoots and uh, LL Cool J had more of a heroic role in the <clears throat> finale. Well, that, and, uh, did, yeah. that makes sense. That's tell... why it feels very tacked on. That makes sense. Did they tell her mm-hmm. that's like... <laughs> Imagine. No, they said, we're doing some reshoots, just jump in the water, we'll (laughs) film around you. We're we're doing reshoots, (laughs) we need to shoot, we need to change the film, audience testing's come back, we need to kill your character off, because everyone hates you, (laughs) so... Well, th- th- he never says um, never says anything about that. I can assume that they probably didn't get her back, because after she jumps into the water, which I can imagine in the original version, she probably did that, but Thomas Jane came in and distracted the shark and she managed to yeah, climb yeah, away yeah. or something. So you just have to CGI her getting eaten. It does explain why Thomas Jane and LL Cool Jane, like, no one really reacts to her death in any particular, you know, way. Yeah. It's just very matter-of-fact. Oh, well, she's gone. Um, but there is a still from the original ending of her kissing Thomas Jane upon the surface, so... I guess I don't know if they went back then and maybe like trimmed out some bits that hinted at a flirtation between the pair of them. Like I still think there's some they're going for some kind of uh, yeah free song between the two of them, but it's never terribly strong. But that's it. It just felt to me like they were doing that, but it was badly written rather than mm. they weren't doing it. <laughs> mm. Mm. So 
Um, I want to pick out a couple of points, sort of more specific things that I've got mm. notes on. There's a there's a very opening scene where we see a shark has escaped and it attacks a boat or something, and mm. uh, it never really comes to anything that it's just escaped. I think it's just to, to set up the scary sharks right at the beginning. Mm. Um, but there's a, there's a little bit where someone drops a bottle of red wine and it pours into the water and it looks like blood mm. in the water. And I'm like, mm. uh, that was like, that's in the first few minutes. I was like, oh, that's quite a nice little directorial touch that the red wine. It's like jaws with blood. And uh, unfortunately mm. that led me hope, gave me hope <laughs> that there may be some sort of, sort of subtlety and <laughs> uh, finesse in this film, which, uh, Turned out not to be. So I don't know whoever idea yeah. that was that Rennie Harlan took on. Um, good on them. <clears throat> <laughs> and there's another bit later on where I think it's um, when uh, Thomas Jane is like underwater and he bumps into Stellan Skarsgård's corpse that's just knocking about. And <laughs> and it sort of jumps out very much like the head in Jaws. Um, mm, and it, yeah. I think that was a deliberate homage as well. Um, and they pull a license plate out of oh uh, yeah the the license plate thing is very in fact they kept going back to that like they mentioned it about three times as if if they were going like (laughs) remember in Jaws the license plate eh?" (laughs) (laughs) yeah Um, there was another bit where this I mean the science of this is you know the the less said the better but they (laughs) essentially they're experimenting on sharks brains to try and cure alzheimer's okay but they're extracting brain juice from it um mm. at one point mm. and that pretty much involves stabbing a giant needle into its brain and sucking out some juice <laughs> some, yeah <laughs> and then and then they they pour that on a bit of dead brain cell that is from an alzheimer's patient and it sort of sparks back into life and they're like oh look it's a magical cure um I mean, I'm pretty sure that's not how science works. Uh, you can't just have like a bit of dead brain cell on a slide and then it comes back to life. I don't, and uh, and it fixes all your neurons or whatever. <laughs> so you know, I guess you got to just take it all with a pinch of salt, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is a bit at the beginning. There's quite a, it's quite a slow start actually. The whole thing sort of. It's a steady pace at the beginning, definitely. Got a lot of setup with Samuel L. Jackson coming to this facility and then sort of going around introducing all the characters. It really takes its time. Um, yeah. I'm not sure why, really, because it's not like very interesting. And yeah. then they they wrangle this shark. Well, Thomas Jane does, and he they strap it into this thing and they're sucking its brain juice out and all that. The shark yeah. man, it sort of you know instinctively as you might do as a shark, lashes out and yeah. sort of like, you know, bites off uh, Stellan Skarsgård's arm. And mm. Thomas Jane's reaction is to try and blow its head off with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, I mean, d- does that seem a bit aggressive? <laughs> it's like, the shark is just, you know, it's been tied up. It's, it's just instinctively, you know, snarling around and grabs something. Uh, maybe just sort of release it back into the water. Maybe that would be the first thing to do, get it out of the way. Well, it, it felt out of place for him, especially considering how his character is, uh, well, one of the scenes in which he's introduced is him in the actually in the water with one of the sharks, and he does a move and gets on its back and pulls the license plate out of its mouth. So he was kind of introduced as, like, their handler, their keeper. Yeah. So that automatically makes me think that he's going to have some kind of more attachment to them. So for him just to grab a gun and go to shoot it yeah, felt strange. But I guess he had to do that because then Saffron Burroughs is the one wanting to keep them alive. Well, exactly. Then that, and that does feel key. like that's the whole point. But if he hadn't done it and maybe like, uh, you know, Michael Rappaport was going to do it or Samuel Jackson suddenly grabbed a gun, like that was his instinctive reaction. And then they mm. both could go, oh, no, I need to save its brain. And he's like, no, it's a shark. It's alive. It's a living thing. And it, but, he's never, yeah. but he never really plays down that kind of, hey, I love the sharks, man. Like, we, we get hinted, yeah. at, hinted at some sort of past where he was in military prison and, you know, he's got a bit of a murky history. And now, so, like, he's mm. had to turn to living with sharks because the huma- humans <laughs> won't accept him or something like that. It's very mm. kind of half-baked backstories for all these characters that you don't really get into. I can only assume that the script was probably 
rewritten several times and the the three credited writers are just three of yeah. dozen that yeah. worked it, on it. it and it it is very much that sort of film isn't it it just feels just death by committee it's a glossy studio project for sure mm. yeah and i must i i definitely thought ll cool j is He's the most natural actor in this. Like he's the, he's his performance <laughs> yeah. comes across better than anyone else's. Like even Samuel Jackson just is doing some the Samuel Jackson thing that he does. It's like phoning it in. Mm. Everyone else mm. is just this very acting acting. Whereas LL Cool J feels, I guess, because he's not like a trained actor. I'm assuming he didn't go to Rada, <laughs> but he, mm. he just comes across as very natural. A lot of his scenes are on his own. He's dealing with this parrot. And he's talking to God and stuff, and he comes across... He's the only one with any real personality, apart from Samuel Jackson. I did love the scene when the shark traps him in the oven and then, and then it proceeds to turn on the oven. Uh, and LL Cool J has some like lines like, I'm not gonna be cooked in my own oven. Or like At one point he does say something like... Brothers never make it out of these kinds of situations or something like it felt kind of scary movie influenced like yeah, you know, there's yeah, a bit yeah. of scream influence in there um yeah. but all the god talk did annoy me quite yeah, a lot because it's you know every scene he's holding his crucifix and yeah but he's called to god. he's called preach they call him preach and that's obviously that's when the writers were like right we've got a character here what character shall we give him uh he can be like really religious but because he's like, because <laughs> he's black, that means he's also from from the ghetto, and so he's like, he's quite street, mm. but pr- religious as well. <laughs> I yeah. guess. Do, <laughs> yeah. I, I Do you guys feel like the film made enough of the sharks being super intelligent? Because it, it it always struck me <gasps> both times I've watched this, it's always kind of. I forget that they're just not normal sharks, and then they'll do something that's a bit smart for sharks. But it's never, other than that oven thing, it's never, like, really obviously smart. Well, they hypothesise at the end that the sharks have actually been funnelling them a certain way around the complex to try and flood it to get them higher up so that they can get through the Mm. um, less strong fence. The only bit that hints at that, like, in practice, is when Thomas Jane has just seen Stellan Skarsgård's corpse, uh, Michael Rappaport's been eaten, and Thomas Jane is going to open a door, and the shark could go and get him, but it sort of swims past him, so in order to allow him to open up the door to flood in the next part of the facility mm. and let them through. Um, that's really the only bit. Um, yeah. And they swim backwards. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> something else. That is a, but the problem with it is the, the, the level of this film, the writing in this film, is that if they wanted to show that the sharks were intelligent... We just see them playing chess and listening to classical music, <laughs> <laughs> or like right. talking about quality well, this is wines. The thing. Like if I if I was watching a film like this and they were just normal sharks and they said the sharks have been funneling us this specific way on purpose, I'd be like, yeah, right. <laughs> like it, it wouldn't seem that out of place in this sort of a film, anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. We've pretty much covered all my notes apart from at the end. I've I've put. This film has become repetitive now and it just feels dragged out. Um, <clears throat> because once it all kicked off, it was just like, oh, they go into this room, a shark's attack and it floods. All right, they go into this room, it floods and then a shark attacks. And it was just getting mm-hmm. very kind of samey and samey. So it definitely mm-hmm. started to drag a little bit near the end. But, uh... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's almost exactly the halfway mark in the film when Samuel L. Jackson dies, and mm. for me that was very much kind of like a marking point. Like, all right, this is less fun now. <laughs> yeah, but because now he, it loses his presence. I think that's part of it, but mm. It, mm. it is just kind of like, yeah, this should have been sixty minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. But yeah, like I say, considering how the the opening felt very slow, like opening, as in, yeah. it was the sort of thing that would work if it was setting up some good character and developing stuff. But it doesn't. It just feels like we're just plodding along, and then the end feels repetitive because it's just the same action sequence again and again. It is a bit mm. like, what what happened? What's the story in this? Like, where is the story? <laughs> we like, <laughs> could have done so much more with this. Yeah. Yeah, it would it would have been a benefit to have some kind of a human story in there somewhere, but 
Um, I mean, the only hint of that is Saffron Burroughs is presumably doing this research to, because she has some kind of uh, family uh, issue with Alzheimer's. I think she says that her dad had it or something, uh, but it never really comes of anything. Uh, yeah, but then that's not the kind of film that this is, you know trying to be. I think it's it's fascinating considering that this film had a healthy budget. It was like $80 million, which I couldn't believe when I saw it. Because this kind of film would never get that kind of a budget in this you know, They haven't spent it on the actors, have they? <laughs> well, no, exactly. It's not like, an, you know, maybe the animatronic sharks were yeah. really expensive. Actually, no, I can imagine it was expensive to film out on the water like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's... Um, I can't imagine this kind of thing ever getting made now. There are too many people in positions of power at studios to not let these <laughs> kinds of things go through. Um, but in the 90s, it was a different age, I suppose, and audiences were less discerning. Were they? Did this film do well? Um, well, it made $164 million, according to Wikipedia. So it, it made double its budget, pretty much. Uh, which... I guess that means it made its money back, but not enough profit to warrant a sequel, or at least uh, a theatrical sequel. Well, do you know anything about this sequel? Is it in any way connected at all, or is it just tying into the name? Well, it just... It looks like a very tenuous sequel. It just basically the same thing is happening again, and this research is being continued on. It's not the terribly... Same, the same company? Well, it's not terribly clear... Ha from the trailer, um, how connected it's going to be. Is but it? Is it that someone's made a low-budget shark film and then paid to use Deep Blue Sea as a name? Well, they are. I mean, they are doing the same thing. It's like genetically enhanced sharks, uh, and they're going to try and cure some kind of disease, I assume. And the sharks are smart, so unless like someone made a low-budget shark film and hadn't seen Deep Blue Sea or heard of it, and just ended up with the same thing, and instead of calling it a remake, they're calling it a sequel. Don't call it um, a comeback. <laughs> uh, Reimagining. But yeah, it just kind of cropped up out of nowhere. I, I remember yeah. reading about it in an article. Well, And like I say, it's going straight to streaming and Deep Blue, DVD. Deep Blue Sea is a bit of a cult favourite, isn't it? But very much in a kind of so crap it's watchable when you're drunk kind of cult. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So there's obviously someone's found enough niche there to think it's worth doing a sequel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But... Well, I think there is still an audience for this kind of film. They're just not willing to go to a cinema to see it anymore. They will watch it on TV or buy it on a home media format, but that's about it, really. Like they've made, like, how many Sharknado films now? Five? People love sharks. <laughs> Hashtag Calvin's Sharks. Let Sol know how much you love your sharks, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so that he'll hopefully stop beating me and just let me review another shark film on the podcast at some point. He's such a depressive leader. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I just think they're a bit like, you've seen one shark movie, you've seen them all. <laughs> this is nowhere near the same film as The Shallows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you had, to, you had to kind of run Jaws through your head there for a second, and then you thought Jaws 3 is very similar, <laughs> so I better go oh, with The Shallows. How did you know? <laughs> uh. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm not sure what Deep Blue Sea... 2's release is going to be like here in the UK, but I certainly hope to seek it out so I can cover it in our Review of the Year episode when we <laughs> do that. Are they calling later. it Deep 2C? <laughs> no, it's quite disappointing. It is just Deep Blue C 2. Uh. Which I, I didn't think they just like stuck a number on a sequel these days. I thought it was kind of passe. I thought you had to have a colon. do a semicolon and a Deep Blue C. <sighs> Smart Sharks again, or something like that. <laughs> deep blue sea, sea blue deeper. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, uh, should we do ratings for deep blue sea? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'm gonna go strong seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought you were gonna go higher. To be honest, that's. That's pretty uh, pretty reasonable. 
Yeah, for, for, for what it is. Okay. Alan? I gave it a basic five. Okay. Mm. Uh, it's a five from me as well. Oh. Hmm. There we go. <laughs> um, Shall we try and pitch out a, mm. a sequel with our combined super enhanced <laughs> brains? <laughs> Uh, I've got a- maybe that's what they should do. They should let sharks decide what the sequel is. Going to be. <laughs> I don't know how you'd go about doing that, but well, I've got um, I've got an idea for you. This is just a title. Um, oh. oh, deep blue sea of tranquility. Ooh, uh, sharks in space. Colon sharks Ooh. in space. Ooh, well, <laughs> sharks okay. on the moon. Like, can we can we build on what I was saying about how? It doesn't feel like the sharks are smart enough, like, obviously, in this mm. film. So, <laughs> okay. can we... First of all, so we pick up at the end of the film, and some of the sharks are still alive. Okay. And they're out in the ocean. How? I mean, they, two of them got blown up, and They were so smart, they, they put a deep... Like, it wasn't them that got blown up, it was Stellan Skarsgård. They threw his foot, <laughs> so, so it looked like they were getting blown up. <laughs> It was a, it was a, okay. a trick, and so these these smart sharks are now free, and they develop a okay. shark society, and they can talk. We need talking sharks. <laughs> what language? Okay, English. Oh, of course, yeah. It'd be ridiculous. <laughs> I guess that would be all they'd know. Yeah, or like they, a little they, bit of Stellan Skarsgård country talk. What if what the parrot lives from? with them? The parrot is like a translator, so yeah. they speak shark, <laughs> but the parrot translates it to. A, English. No, they're, they're, we need to show how smart they are so they talk. To, they can speak because later on they'll be like pathetic human. <laughs> we have you. <laughs> and anyway, um, long story short, shark society developed space travel. <laughs> oh, it ties in with Alan's yeah, yeah, yeah. idea. Sharks in space. Oh. And, and so... they and they go and inhabit the moon and create a better world. <laughs> <laughs> Free of. Prejudice and <laughs> yeah. cancer. And Doesn't matter what sort of shark they are. <laughs> yeah. We all know that. All sorts of That's sharks. Um, <laughs> there's, there's like 200 species of sharks. What about... about more than that? Oh, all should we sharks. get... Yeah, all the different... There's like the shark juice has infected all the sharks. So it's like the Planet of the Apes, but uh, <laughs> it's like sharks... Planet of Sharks. Yeah, but, in, but in, and it's an origin of them getting their own planet. I like uh, Alan's uh, deep blue sea of tranquility idea. I like that they would have... <laughs> because, like, ob- obviously the Alzheimer's research was too dangerous to be continued on Earth, but they needed to continue <laughs> it in some way, so they had to transport the sharks to space so that if they did escape, they wouldn't be able to, you know, uh, breed in Earth's oceans and, you know, have more super smart sharks out there. So, uh, yeah, that that's my interpretation, anyway, of your idea, Alan. Well, I also wanted to make sure... I, I really felt that LL Cool J should be the focus of the sequel. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, because he's the best character in it. <laughs> so, How would you get him into space? He's been promoted to the head of the, he's the chef. research he's, company. No, he's head NASA chef. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> what, what does the NASA chef do? They have to dehydrate. Little yeah, he has to come up with good portion. recipes that taste good when you haven't got a very good se- uh, sense of taste, which you lose in space. <laughs> that's, that's why space food is very, very flavorful because uh, you, you can't taste in the same way. So the only thing is, there isn't much water in space. So um, <laughs> what? There's, there's I, the I guess that they would have to take it up on the on the ship. But then that could be a way of the sharks um, displaying how smart they are because there's only a certain amount of water on the ship that they have to find out, they have to figure out ways of moving the water around the ship so that they can, and they can only have, you know, they can only have it in two rooms but the rooms would be half full or they can have it in one room and it'd be completely full. All the puzzles that the sharks would have to solve and that the audience would love watching. Okay. So where does LL Cool J come into this? Uh, I'm I'm less bothered about LL Cool J. <laughs> I want him on the moon, and he opens a church, <laughs> and he's he's like a missionary. He's trying to convert the sharks to Christianity. <laughs> but, yeah, no but they're too it. intelligent for it. The sharks' brains have evolved to uh, be able to breathe in space. <laughs> 
That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's our setup. Uh, where do we go from there? Well, you have to have astronauts there dealing with something and then they get attacked by the sharks. Or what yeah, if you've got super yeah. smart sharks and they're experimenting on humans, trying to make them more intelligent? Mm. And then the humans uh, fight back. I think we could just get the same cast of the first film back for that. So we have Saffron Burroughs, Thomas Jane, Stellan Skarsgård, Samuel Jackson, like, in a pen. <laughs> and there's these sharks on the outside going around with, like, clipboards and floppy disks and stuff. And <laughs> talking about how smart these humans are and how they're going to solve the, the, um, the, uh, the age-old shark ailment of not having legs. Because they've going to develop, like, you know, their own cure for not having legs. Because... <laughs> These humans have legs, so right. got to figure yeah, that out. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it makes as much sense as the first film. And then the sharks break out, and uh, no, no, sorry, Saffron Burrows and crew break out and start e- eating the sharks. <laughs> I don't know. I think we should have um, a load of crisps, and they have Gary Lineker in captivity. Yeah. I'm more than this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Gary Lineker escapes and starts eating the crisps. Can we remake... Uh, can it be like Alien, but with crisps? And Gary Lineker's <laughs> like... <laughs> they, he's on this planet, this Gary Lineker. And they, the crisps accidentally pick him up on this spaceship without meaning to. And there's a scene where one of the crisps is in an air... Like an air vent. And another crisp is watching on the screen. And you just see these dots go like, doo, 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 doo. and then there's just a shot of, of Gary Lineker's like face as he goes, like, about to eat the crisp. Oh, brilliant! And then yeah. it cuts back to the crisp looking at the the um, the panel, and you just hear a <laughs> as he like bites into the crisp. <laughs> uh, I think that should be it. Um, well, I did. Yeah. My only other ideas were that, um, you know, just do the same thing, but with different animals. Oh, right. So, like, you know, LL Cool J opens, like, a, a restaurant slash church in the Canadian wilderness, and it gets overrun by bears. <laughs> I think LL Cool J should put some of that super intelligent juice in his parrot, because he loves parrots. He opens a parrot sanctuary. So like, the parrot did die. No, but he has another one. He, he opens a parrot sanctuary in its honor, in its memory, because um, he needs he to like take it parrots. more e- like easy going forward. He needs to just relax. So he's in, he's in a nice warm country. He's opening up his parrot parrot sanctuary. He's got loads of parrots. He puts some super intelligent juice on them. They start killing everyone. <laughs> the birds, but with parrots <laughs> exclusively with parrots. Hmm. <laughs> and it's it is oh. just it's just the birds remade with parrots and LL Cool J, and LL Cool J is just kind of improvising, is sort of muttering to himself like about <laughs> God and this and that. And he's got a pet squirrel. <laughs> what? Why? <laughs> just for him to talk to. I think we uh, uh, floated the idea of a squirrel sidekick in a pitch for another. <laughs> film. Um, I think it was Alan's pitch to one of the Alien episodes. Um, and Alan got really upset with us for suggesting oh, it. Yeah. So we, we've come full circle now that Alan himself is suggesting a squirrel sidekick. I think this should be the last episode, actually. With, <laughs> because of that. Perfect ending. You think that? You think this is a perfect ending? <laughs> to what we've done? Yes. <laughs> I've got a I've got a shark fact we can end on if you like. Oh, okay, then hit me. Well, you know, people are very afraid of sharks, you know that, right? And uh but sharks kill like four people a year, something along those lines. It's not very many. So all this shark fear is a bit un un You know why that is though? Um, why they kill four people a year? Why it's only four? Cuz they can't get on land. Cuz we've got <laughs> guns. <laughs> Well, that was my fact. Uh, humans kill uh, over 70 million sharks every year. Yeah. Didn't we? So, so think about who that. Are the real, who are think, the real monsters? So, no, no, think about that, though, Alan. Without guns, 
that would be 70 million sharks killing humans every year, but we're able to shoot them first when they come at us. Come at us. I'm not sure how many sharks get shot. It's self defense. That's they're mostly dragged out <laughs> in big nets and then no, you slowly shoot. suffocate. <laughs> Didn't we talk about this in the Shallows episode? I'm pretty sure Soul got up a big sheet of. <laughs> we talk about things that are more dangerous. Yeah, well, that, that than, was like you're more sharks, likely to be killed by being trampled by a herd of donkeys than a shark and that sort of <laughs> stuff, which was all very oh. dubious. What's more dangerous mm. than sharks? Smoking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so there we so go so what was the shark fact again <laughs> uh, human, humans kill 70 million sharks every year for food that's not a shark fact that's just a that's just sad why would, well, why would you I want didn't to end say, on that I didn't say it was a happy fact I said it was a fact mm. <laughs> because I'm trying to bring a bit of uh, perspective to this whole thing you know Stop being scared it's a good of the job sharks. they're not smart, though, isn't it? Super smart. I did think it was quite um, selfish of LL Cool J's character to just assume that God wanted the humans to be the victors in that situation. Because presumably he created sharks as well. I don't think you understand I, religion, I think Calvin. <laughs> animals were made as, like, property for humans by God. Isn't that basically the... He gave uh, human... Humans dominion over all the animals yeah. and uh, of the land and there, and we'll see. Mm. I hope God's not dead; he's surely alive. <laughs> Roar like a shark, <laughs> and Angelina Jolie can punch it. Look at all these references <laughs> to past episodes. This should actually see. Now we up. definitely did when we did Raw. I put I I did a pitch about sharks called. Roars, I think it was called. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. oh, I'm getting nostalgic for the old episodes. Didn't you put sharks in your Tremors pitch as well? Me? No, no, that was lions. That was burrowing lions. <laughs> you, you definitely did a pitch that was like... Oh, no, no wait, that it, was the the tremor, it was the Tremors pitch. And they were, it was Tremors meets Jaws. Yeah. Because oh, we that in, was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you love your sharks, don't you? I guess... Uh, Deep Blue Sea versus Anaconda? That'd be the appropriate mm. crossover in this instance. Why? Both 90s films. What about arachnophobia? Just sharks and loads of big spiders, like, <laughs> raining down. Oh, that'd be good, yeah. Yeah, that'd be very good. Yeah. That's what we need to do, just cross... Uh, Shark with another <gasps> animal. No, but no, imagine no, no, that, like, like the spider get falls in the tank at the genetics lab. Stellan Skarsgård, yeah. like, get, I don't know, get um, Bill Skarsgård or someone in as his son. The <laughs> research carries on. He presses the button, doesn't check. Out pops a fucking massive shark, but with big spider legs, so it can walk on land. Ooh, <laughs> that's our that's our sequel. Yeah, that'd be spider scary, sharks. man. A shark with spider legs. <laughs> Fuck. Hmm. I think you go the you go the Terminator route where uh, the shark from the first film becomes your friend and protects you from even worse sharks. <laughs> and it can talk now. <laughs> Hasta la vista. <laughs> I know now why you cry. That's what it's. Like. <laughs> yeah, it's voiced by Werner Herzog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he would be a good shark. <laughs> Thanks for listening to what is in fact not the final episode of the series. We'll be back next week with more shark action in Live and Let Die. But for now, if you have enjoyed the show, then please leave us a positive rating and or review on iTunes so that more listeners like yourself can find and enjoy what we do here. Until next time, hashtag Calvin Sharks. <laughs>